when you hit rock bottom, the only way you can go is up. This is a story about a conscious attempt at changing your mindset. It's the story of a little indie band that should never really have made it big, and the tumultuous recording of an album that led to a surprise chart-topping song. This is the story about Modest Mouse and their 2004 album, Good News for People Who Love Bad News. Chapter 1, Early Days of Modest Mouse. The name Modest Mouse stems from a Virginia Wolf line describing ordinary people as, quote, modest mouse-colored people. Modest Mouse is an American indie rock band that formed in 1993 in Issaquah, Washington. That's important because they wanted to distinguish as not being from Seattle. The band was founded by guitarist and vocalist Isaac Brock, drummer Jeremiah Green, and bassist Eric Judy. Known for their quirky, eclectic music, the group's stylistic sounds blend elements of indie rock, punk, and experimental rock, all characterized by Brock's distinctive vocal delivery and awkwardly poetic lyrics. Brock met Judy while at a local family-owned video store where he worked as a teenager, and the two later met Jeremiah Green while attending a post-hardcore show. By the end of the 1990s, Modest Mouse had established themselves as a key player in the indie rock scene, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Their early work was characterized by its lyrical prowess, emotional intensity, and experimental approach, and the ability to convey a sense of restlessness and existential pondering as well. I personally recall discovering Modest Mouse in the year 2000, not necessarily from the release of their stunning album from that year, the moon in Antarctica, but by exploring the fringes of indie rock at the time through, yeah, Napster. Songs like Dramamine off their 1995 album, This Is A Long Drive For Someone With Nothing To Think About, and Cowboy Dan from the 1997 album Lonesome Crowded West, and I Came From A Rat off of the moon in Antarctica, all pulled me in through a few digital bootleg live shows that I found. I'd eventually pull several of their albums and singles into my collection. To understand Modest Mouse, you need to dig into the depths of their history, though. This is from a 2004 issue of Spin. Brock grew up dirt poor and started working as a janitor at the age of 11. He was a teenager living in a shed next to his mom's trailer when he met future Modest Mouse bassist Eric Judy and guitarist Dan Gallucci. They were into the early grunge stuff from Seattle, into the weird homespun punk coming out of Olympia labels like K and Kill Rock Stars. When they started making music, it was less like the Modest Mouse who signed to Up Records and more like Tree People, the band that Doug Marsh was in prior to forming Built to Spill. Chapter two, the rise of indie rock. Prior to their 2000 album, the band was on Seattle label Up Records, but for the moon and Antarctica, they signed with major label Epic, following the footsteps of other Pacific Northwest indie bands like Built to Spill, who would sign to Atlantic a few years prior, and soon to come, Death Cab for Cutie. With the moon and Antarctica, it seemed Modest Mouse was poised to truly follow suit, retaining a lot of their quirky indie sound, but with a slightly more refined and produced side that progressed at just enough, but not too much. Through the early 2000s, an upheaval was taking place, something I hinted at a moment ago. The rise of the internet and digital music platforms like Napster and later iTunes all played a crucial role in indie rock's growth. These platforms allowed indie bands to reach global audiences without needing major label support. Social media and music blogs also helped spread the word about new bands and releases. I mean, I was part of that. In 2006 is when I started the Fence Post music blog. But back in 2004, this was all just starting. So Modest Mouse's presence on a major label was kind of notable. Stop biting me. By 2004, indie rock had been gaining steam for several years. The release of The Strokes' debut album, is this it in 2001 is often considered a pivotal moment and hot on its footsteps was the domination of the white stripes with white blood cells in 2001 and elephant in 2003 these two bands helped bring indie music to the forefront first with post brit pop style of garage rock revival and the latter with its raw bluesy minimalist sounds then came 
2004. Modest Mouse, with the retention of its indie roots, the powerful lyrical oddity that is Isaac Brock, and major label backing, all these things were poised to push the band to a wider, more mainstream audience. And that's just what happened. Chapter 3, Good News for People Who Love Bad News. The years after the moon and Antarctica were anything but smooth for Modest Mouse. In an LA Times article from 2004 penned by Susan Carpenter, she opens with the inspiration behind good news, and it's not all roses. The death of a close friend conjures a spectrum of emotion, sorrow and anger and disbelief. Multiply those feelings by two, and you have the inspiration for good news for people who love bad news. The latest record from Northwest indie rock trio Modest Mouse. In 2002, Brock spent the better part of a week in a New York jail after a DUI charge landed him in hot water while attempting to cross the Canadian border. Brock ended up in AA meetings, mandatory from the DUI fallout, and he'd leave those meetings uh, and get trashed. He wasn't in a good place, and the pressure was on as well. The band rented a house in Portland where they'd start working on what would become good news for people who love bad news. There was optimism on Brock's behalf that it would become a place of creativity, but it was a bit overstretched. Green was on antidepressants after a bipolar diagnosis, and his behavior was a bit unpredictable and erratic. He would quit the band in 2003 to focus on his side project, Vels. Quite underappreciated, I might add. Though unofficial word was he had a bit of a nervous breakdown. Green ended up floating around Seattle and New York, ultimately checking himself into a mental institution where they recommended he up his antidepressants. Instead, he would go cold turkey and suffer terrible withdrawals. The band, too, struggled quite a bit, questioning whether or not they should just throw in the towel and call it quits. Yes, quitting was on the table. They weren't sure if they could create music without Green, but they tried anyway. Rather than continue working on the material they'd started in the location they rented, they decided a complete change of scenery was needed. Things had to reach a peak of bad news, noted Brock in an interview on AV Club in 2004. Everything had to fall apart in order for us to figure out where we stood. So we decided that instead of recording with someone we knew, we were gonna do the opposite. We were going to the opposite side of the country and record with a producer we'd never met before. Relocating to Oxford, Mississippi with drummer Benjamin Welker on loan from Portland duo The Helio Sequence, Modest Mouse landed at Sweet Tea, the recording studio of Dennis Herring, who worked with the likes of Camperman Beethoven, throwing muses, jars of clay, and even counting crows. The sessions were brutal, with Herring taking a very strict hand with the band. That led to some pretty deep tensions, mostly from Brock directed at Herring, whom he said he wanted to kill many times during the process. However, Brock would go on to state, quote, he was the best man for the job, chapter four, the perseverance of float on. Cornerstone to the album was lead single Float On, a seemingly cheery track with a dark past. Far Out Magazine called it perfectly. When Modest Mouse created Float On, they made one of the greatest perseverance anthems of all time. Quote, I was just kind of fed up with how bad shit had been going and how dark everything was, with bad news coming from everywhere, Brock told the AV Club in 2004. I just want to feel good for a day. He continues, I had some friends die, and with Jeremy, Jeremiah Green, kind of losing it, after we got out of that dark spot with everything melting down with the band, I just wanted to make a positive record. I think we managed to make a quarter of the record positive, and the rest is either kind of dark or more just relaxing into things being how they are. Resigned. Earlier, I talked about all the things going on with the band. Mental breakdown, substance abuse, DUI charge, the death of a few close friends. But zoom out and you continue to get unpleasantries. The 9-11 attacks, a war with Iraq, started on questionable evidence. An onslaught of propaganda that seemed just so dire, yet completely bland in comparison to what we get bombarded with today. 
These things set the stage for Modest Mouse's entire 2004 album, but Float On was Brock's conscious attempt at writing a cheery song. Mindset has a lot to do with success, and this conscious attempt by Brock to write a cheery song in dire times ended up being less about the act of doing and more about the act of coming to terms with the idea that everything is going to be fine. The lyrics cycle through an onslaught of terrible things, but you persevere through it all because you know in the end, it'll be okay. Far Out continues by making the distinction of I versus we. While the track could work just as well with the line, I'll float on, the fact that it's a we feels like an anthem for anyone who's ever been wronged in their life as they proceed to watch the world float by regardless. Remember that DUI? Well, there's more to that story. The DUI stemmed from an accident Brock had in Oregon. He hired a lawyer who told him he'd get things sorted. But when returning from a quick trip to see Niagara Falls, Brock was arrested for being a fugitive. Stacked onto the DUI was attempted murder. In the car with Brock, the day of the DUI was his friend and his friend's girlfriend the latter of whom dislocated her thumb. In Oregon at the time, and I'm not sure if that stands today, any injury involving alcohol paired with a DUI gets a charge of attempted murder. Ultimately, he had to hire a different lawyer to help him get out. Most of the charges were dropped and he did a short stint on a road crew. Here's another quote from Brock talking about his time on the crew. At one point, we were cleaning out this football field-sized area of blackberry bushes with our machetes, and we run across some poison ivy. We point it out, and the cops like, cut it down, get rid of it. We do, and then all the gloves and vests got contaminated by it. And the next thing I know, I've got rashes all over. All over my ding-dong! I couldn't get it to go away, because every time I'd go back, I'd recontaminate myself. The legacy of good news. Float On debuted in the Billboard Top 20. It became a hit, got a ton of play on MTV, which still played music back then, and was nominated for a Grammy, losing to U2's Vertigo, which is a damn shame. Good News for People Who Love Bad News would be nominated for a Grammy as well, with the album going platinum to boot. It's a testament to the power of a positive mindset, or at least a neutral one. There is true power in having a positive mindset, to having the right mindset in any situation. It's even more important in situations where bad things happen, or where you're just not in control. Next, join me as I dig into another 2004 album and the tragic horse accident that led to its making. Join me as I explore Misery is a Butterfly by Blonde Redhead. As one commenter stated a while back, this dude is a damn nerd. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, this little guy is Waffles, and I'll see you in the next video.